welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I am your host, Catherine Hadro, in our Washington, D.C. studio, and it is so good to be back here as we kick off our 2020 pro-life coverage. In this week's show, Washington, D.C. considers a bill that would deregulate abortion in our nation's capital. A local Catholic pro-life leader weighs in. Pregnant actress Michelle Williams uses her Golden Globes acceptance speech to promote abortion. We speak out. And this. I want our lawmakers to understand who we really are. Less than one mile from Congress sits a pregnancy care center serving women in need. Find out more. But first, our top story, over 200 members of Congress asked the Supreme Court to reconsider Roe versus Wade. 39 senators and 168 members of the House signed the amicus brief last week for the upcoming Supreme Court case G versus June Medical Services. That case is over a Louisiana law requiring abortion centers meet the same safety standards as those of other ambulatory surgical centers. The lawmakers argue Louisiana's safety regulations on abortion centers are constitutional and the court should, quote, uphold the decision that kept the regulations in place. The members of Congress also called the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, which legalized abortion nationwide, quote, unworkable. They asked the court to, quote, again take up the issue of whether Roe and Casey should be reconsidered and, if appropriate, overruled. Joining us now from Capitol Hill is one of the lawmakers who signed on to this amicus brief, Representative Greg Murphy of North Carolina. Congressman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. First off, why did you decide to sign on to this amicus brief? Well, I think it's important when you're dealing with the issue of abortion, we're talking about the life of a child um, as, as the primary issue here, but we're also needing to talk about the life, the safe, uh, safety and welfare of the mother. And where we have an instance where um, abortions, while still sorrowfully legal, uh, legal in this country, we have to worry about what happens to the mother during this, what is it truly a surgical procedure. And being able to have access to uh, uh, emergent medical care and resuscitation is altogether the right thing to do. And I think it's important that states require that for institutions and for facilities that actually do abortions. So I think the Louisiana um, issue is a strong issue. Uh, you know, I actually dealt with some of this back when I was a state legislator uh, when we were dealing with uh, birthing centers for the same issue. When, uh, when there's a delivery of a child or uh, any of those things that go along with childbirth, there needs to be some access, readily accessed uh, medical care at a higher level. And it's altogether the right thing to do for the safety of the mother. And to that point, Congressman, how could the Supreme Court ruling on G versus June Medical Services potentially impact pro-life laws across the nation? What do you think our viewers need to know? Well, I think the most important thing is that uh, we're not going to be deterred in um, our stance against abortion. And um, while abortion is still, um, as I said, sorrowfully legal in this country, we have to worry about the ramifications and the safety of, of the mother during this surgical procedure. Um, you know, getting rid of abortion uh, and uh, overturning Roe versus Wade is one issue. But in the meanwhile, we have to look at not only the safety and health and welfare um, of the child, but we have to look at it for the mother's uh, viewpoint also. The House of Representatives remains under Democratic control with Representative Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. Congressman, in your opinion, will there be any opportunities to pass pro-life legislation in 2020? Well, um, as long as uh, Speaker Pelosi is the speaker right now, I think our chances um, will be challenged to do this. But nonetheless, uh, we're not going to be deterred. We know the importance of the meaning of life and the sanctity of life and the safety and uh, welfare of the mother and the child. And we're not going to be deterred about uh, whether things are going to pass or not because we have to we have a mission and we have to work on accomplishing it. Congressman, while we have you here this week, Planned Parenthood released their annual report revealing an uptick in abortion since last year and a continued steep decline of non-abortion related services. Will this, do you think, renew efforts to defund Planned Parenthood of their nearly half a billion dollars of federal funding? 
Well, I, I hope so. You know, last year, close to 346,000 abortions were performed in the United States. What a tragedy. That's 10,000 more than the year before and 10,000 the year before, disproportionately um, with African Americans and minorities. And so we have a national tragedy. We have a true national tragedy, and it's something that I think is a great sorrow for this nation, and that is something that we really need to come to grips with and try to reverse the horrible tragedy that's going on in this country. And finally, Congressman, this is your first time on our program, and you yourself are Catholic. How does your Catholic faith guide your work in Congress and on this issue of life? Well, you know, as a Catholic, as a Christian, I truly believe that uh, our life is given to us by God and by our Creator. Now, we have no, uh, no reason that human life should be ever uh, taken in doubt. It believes, in my opinion, uh, granted by the Holy Spirit and begins at conception. And it is uh, one of the true uh, greatest gifts that we're given by God. And so we have to work um, on keeping that, uh, that sacred in our life, not only in our religious life, but really in our secular life. And so it will craft me um, in legislation that I, uh, that I work towards and which I uh, sponsor and believe in. But it's really, you know, we're dealing with a basic issue here, that life starts at conception. And we have to do all that we can uh, to preserve it. Representative Greg Murphy of North Carolina, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. God bless. And joining us now for a pro-life reaction in our D.C. studio is Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, thank you for being here. Oh, I've missed you. I'm so happy to be here. It's so good to see you. Okay, over 200 members of Congress signed mm -hmm. onto this amicus mm -hmm. brief in defense of Louisiana's pro-life law. Mm -hmm. Is this going to have any impact on the Supreme Court ruling? I mean, the legislative branch has no power over the judicial mm -hmm. branch. Yes, it's actually a common practice that the court will listen to the opinions of legislators, especially if those le legislators think that the court has overtaken some of their power. And in this case, there's no question that that's the case. Because the argument that they're making is that the courts have prevented the state of Louisiana from, um, from protecting in the law women's health. Um, and that is certainly the prerogative of state legislators anywhere and everywhere. So it's a great thing for the Congress, uh, the federal legislative body, to be making that argument. Is there any potential to overturn Roe v. Wade? What do you think? I think it's highly, highly unlikely mm -hmm. in this particular one. I think there's some interesting and important things that will be examined. One is really, um, really could be real ground shaking, mm -hmm. and that is that it's the question of standing. Does Planned Parenthood have the standing to argue on behalf of women um, what their health is when they're arguing? in specific detail about why they won't abide by legislative standards for the for women's health. So do they have standing in this case to argue for women? Um, we think absolutely not, and that is, a, that is a really strong argument. And say they don't have standing to do that, that means all future cases will be affected potentially by that. Does Planned Parenthood have standing to, to uh, challenge other laws that of course may, so that, then they have to find other people to, to do their bidding for them. That's incredible. And your group, the Susan B. Anthony List, mm -hmm. also filed an amicus brief in this case. What do you hope, Marjorie, the justices keep in mind as they put out their ruling? Well, it's very much like what I was just saying, um, that the health and safety of women should be protected. It is the prerogative of legislators to make sure that they do that. That they, um, that the Planned Parenthood and all abortionists have shown themselves impossible, unwilling to monitor their own behavior. All the horrible situations that we know about, from Klopfer in Indiana, Gosnell in Pennsylvania, those are just the high profile examples. But day after day, we and other organizations um, monitor what's going on in abortion clinics across the country, and it is a horrific horror story that when we will look back, we'll say, why in the world do we let that happen? That's what we want the, them to listen to. And that the sense, the idea that somehow having admitting privileges at a hospital close by is an unreasonable thing is outrageous. Marjorie, here we are now at the beginning of a new year. As a top pro-life leader yourself, what do you think the top pro-life legislative goals need to be in 2020? Well, I think really the two most important things are this. There is no question that confirming judges that the that the Trump and Trump himself um, nominates for all, all the courts, certainly if we have a Supreme Court nomination, but all federal courts, that is the top 
priority. Now, that's not a piece of legislation, but it's the top job of the U.S. Senate to do that. We need to stay focused on that. We need to make sure we know what judges are being uh, considered and confirmed. Otherwise, the most important legislation that's happening right now is in the states, hmm. in the area of late-term abortion, in the um, area of, uh, of where this Louisiana law is and protecting the health and, um, of women, um, and, uh, and several other areas where we're where there may be in a discrimination um, laws uh, in terms of um, Down's children and others, uh, and laws against aborting them just because of that. Any one of those three or several others may be the case that would potentially um, go after and, and potentially um, be the impetus for overturning Roe. So that state legislation is really important and we're very focused on that. So there's a lot to keep our eye on. And mm -hmm. finally, Marjorie, I want to get your reaction to another top story this mm -hmm. week. We'll have much more in depth next week, but this week Planned Parenthood released their annual report revealing yet again another increase in the amount of abortions. What do you think? <coughs> what, are your, what are your initial reactions looking at these numbers from this report and what does it indicate about nation's largest abortion mm -hmm. business? Well, it, it indicates a couple of things. First, that their trajectory is the same, that they continue to overtake the abortion market share. Right now they do 40 percent of abortions in this country every year. That's an, that is a constant increase. And as that market share increases, their um, services directly to women that are actually health services, not abortions, decrease every year. They're consolidating their power. They're actually kind of buying up the mom and shop abortion clinics so that they're like the Kmart, the Walmart of abortion now. Um, on the other hand, the um, we can see that what, what President Trump and and our allies and legislatures across the country want to do, which is to take away their, their funding, um, is absolutely the right thing to do. For the first time ever, they don't receive Title X funding, that federal funding that's the second biggest source for their funding. That's that's finally gone. But um, means, honestly, if we, we have to reelect this president or that funding will go right back, it means that we need to keep on that track. What we really need to do is stop every abortion. That's what we have to do. And then the whole idea of federal funding of it is a moot point. But in the meantime, it's time to stop that flood of money to Planned Parenthood. Absolutely. And like I said, we'll continue to dig into those numbers. Marjorie Dannon Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you for being here. Thank you, Catherine. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith recently introduced the Senate version of the Save Moms and Babies Act, legislation that would prevent the FDA from approving new chemical abortion drugs, put an end to labeling changes for existing drugs, and stop abortionists from dispensing these drugs remotely. If made into law, this bill would stop the expansion of chemical abortions, which are on the rise today. This Save Moms and Babies Act is a common sense bill that would protect both women and unborn children. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Tell your senator to co-sponsor the Save Moms and Babies Act. And here's how you can get your message straight to your lawmaker. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Once you get to this website, you will be able to type in your basic information so we can tailor this message for your specific lawmaker and send it straight to them. Again, the Save Moms and Babies Act would stop the expansion of chemical abortions. We recently saw the overall abortion rate is going down, but chemical abortions by abortion pills are on the rise. Not only are these abortions dangerous for the unborn baby, but for the mother as well. That is why pro-lifers want to see this pro-life Save Moms and Babies Act made into law. Tell your senator to become a co-sponsor of this pro-life bill, which would increase its chance for success by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to our next story, the city council right here in Washington, D.C. will consider an extreme bill which would deregulate abortion in our nation's capital. The Strengthening Reproductive Health Protections Amendment Act of 2019 would prohibit the city government from, quote, interfering with reproductive health decisions and from imposing punishments or penalties for a self-managed abortion, miscarriage, or adverse pregnancy outcomes. It would also prevent the city from, quote, discriminating against employees willing to perform abortion or sterilization procedures. The legislation is currently pending before the Council of the District of Columbia. The Archdiocese of Washington is encouraging local Catholics to make their opposition to this bill known to their city council person. 
Joining us now from the Archdiocese of Washington is Mary Four, the Manager of Catholic Policy and Advocacy. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. First off, can you tell us how does this bill endanger women and girls in D.C.? So the abortion laws in the District of Columbia are already the least restrictive in the country. A woman can have an abortion at any age without parental notification, at any stage in pregnancy, for any reason that she wants. But what this bill does is it says that the D.C. government cannot regulate or interfere with abortion or childbirth in any manner. Are there other areas of the bill that are of concern to you that you want to highlight to our viewers? There are. This bill also says that those who are participating in abortions are protected. Their conscience rights are protected. But those who choose not to participate in abortions, their conscience rights are not protected. And that departs from longstanding federal laws, the church amendments, that's which a, protect both sides. Right, that's of huge concern. And critics of this bill, Mary, say Catholic organizations like Catholic schools, Catholic charities should especially be alarmed. Why is that? So the definition of healthcare provider in this bill is so broad as to encompass anyone who provides healthcare in any manner. And so that includes a number of employees of our Catholic schools and Catholic organizations. Because of that, we, we run into this problem where Catholic organizations under this bill would not be able to act in accordance with their mission. Mary, you mentioned that this law would not only impact abortion regulation, but childbirth regulation. Can you speak more to that? Sure, the bill says that the district government shall not interfere with or regulate or restrict the facilities or services with regard to abortion and also childbirth, sewage removal, sanitary conditions, mandatory reporting of abuse of minors, those are all government regulations mm -hmm. and they're necessary ones. DC already has the highest maternal mortality rate in the country. It's actually double the national average, more than double. And the change in this bill to say there's no regulation of these facilities allowed will only make those conditions worse. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I know before we began this conversation, you were telling me about a possible example that could happen in a kindergarten class with a teacher. Can you give that illustration to our viewers right now? Right, so under this bill, if for example, a kindergarten teacher would say to her class, class, I'll be out, I, I was out last week because unfortunately I had a miscarriage, can we pray for the baby? We would applaud that as beautiful and we would pray for that child. Um, if, however, the teacher would say, class, I'll be out next week because I'm exercising a woman's right to choose and having an abortion, we wouldn't be able to take any action. Wow, and within a Catholic school. Within a Catholic this, school. This law would protect that. Uh, Mary, you work at the Archdiocese of Washington. How has the Archdiocese been encouraging local Catholics and local pro-lifers to respond to this bill? This bill really endangers women, you know, women who are pregnant and planning to give birth to their child and women who are pregnant and struggling with the decision of what to do there. We are urging Catholics all across the district to reach out to those women and support them to help them know that they have a real option there, that abortion is not their only choice. We're also working with our pastors all across the diocese, all across the district mm -hmm. to um, distribute these postcards mm -hmm. um, that oppose the legislation and say, you know, abortion in an unregulated facility by doctors without a license at any stage through nine months is not safe for women. Right. We know no abortion is safe for a woman. Absolutely. And I know we are talking about Washington, D.C. right now. But why should all of our viewers be paying attention to this? Why is this an issue that's not just a local concern? We've seen extremist abortion legislation that has come up in New York. It's, been, it's going to be introduced in Maryland. We've seen it in Virginia. This is some of the most extreme abortion legislation in the country. To say that an abortion clinic that's classified as an ambulatory surgery center does not have to comply with sanitary conditions is extreme mm -hmm. beyond anything that I could have imagined before. And I, I think that we will see this as model legislation throughout the country. Well, thank you for your advocacy and for your pro-life work and for being here today. Mary Ford with the Archdiocese of Washington, thank you. Thank you. When we come back. Many want to keep their baby but don't know how. 
and so we offer material support as well as the pregnancy test. We introduce you to a pregnancy care center steps away from Congress. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Katherine Hadro. Actress Michelle Williams won a Golden Globe this past weekend and used her acceptance speech to defend abortion. That is this week's Speak Out segment. Williams, who was visibly pregnant at the award show, won Best Actress in a limited series for her role in Foss Verdon. Upon receiving her Golden Globe, Williams took to the stage to say she would not, quote, have been able to do this without employing a woman's right to choose, a reference to a previous abortion. Her comments were met with loud applause from the audience. It is a travesty. Williams fell for the lie from hell. You ever need to kill your own child in order to advance in life. It is a travesty she went on to spread that lie to countless more women from a massive platform, all while she carries her unborn child. We in the pro-life movement know that women are strong enough to be a mother and pursue their dreams. Success is not dependent on whether or not you get an abortion. What also strikes me is that this championing of abortion is happening in the midst of Hollywood's Time's Up campaign, the industry's effort to expunge sexual harassment. But memo to Hollywood, by promoting abortion, you are enabling sexual predation. Abortion protects predators and helps to cover up their heinous crimes. Time needs to be up on abortion. While we in the pro-life movement may not have the same platform as the Golden Globes award stage, it is crucial we each use what platform we do have to shed a light on life and to empower women in our circles to welcome the gift of life. And remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death by following this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell your senator to co-sponsor the Save Moms and Babies Act. It's here in Washington, D.C., where a great deal of debate over abortion legislation takes place. And just steps away from lawmakers on Capitol Hill sits a pro-life group that doesn't work on policy for the unborn, but does work on protecting them. Here is this week's Pro-Life Focus. Hi, this is Janet Durig from the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center. I want to remind you about your appointment tomorrow at 2. As political debates over abortion rage on the campaign trail to Congress, one pregnancy care center does the work of the pro-life movement in the shadow of the nation's Capitol building. Janet Durig is executive director of the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center, which serves the women of Washington, D.C. Many want to keep their baby but don't know how, and so we offer material support as well as the pregnancy test. Like many pregnancy care centers, the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center offers material support like baby clothes, diapers, parenting and childbirth classes, and job referrals. And say she chooses life, so then we offer support in so many ways, not just the job we were talking about. And so material support, which is baby clothes and blankets and strollers and high chairs and um, anything that people donate to us, we give back to, to them. The center also offers healing for women who have undergone abortions. We make sure everyone knows that if you leave here choosing the abortion and you feel like you need to talk with someone, you are welcome to come back and there won't be any condemnation. Located less than one mile from the Capitol building, the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center strives to serve as not just aid to women, but as an example of the pro-life movement to the lawmakers nearby. I want our lawmakers to understand who we really are. We walk with them all the way through this situation, not just giving them a pregnancy test. And if they choose life, say, we're glad you chose life and go on your merry way. We walk with them through that pregnancy. That's an example we can all use. And the Capitol Hill Pregnancy Center tells us they recently received an ultrasound donated by the Knights of Columbus. And while they are equipped with nurses, the pro-life clinic does not yet have a doctor licensed in D.C. to read and register the machine. So let's pray they soon find a doctor who is a great fit to use this life-affirming technology. 
And that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, be sure to reach us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or connect with us on social media. Just search for EWTN Pro-Life on all the major platforms. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.